Well, we've got an exciting treat for everyone today. We're here with Dr. Edward Hallowell. He's done more for the, our understanding of ADHD than anybody else on the planet. So, Dr. Ned, welcome to London, and thank you so much for coming for this. Well, thank you, Winford. You, you and I uh, talk about doing a lot for this cause. You really have opened the door to uh, cerebellar stimulation and the non-medication approaches to treating ADD. And by the way, I still call it ADD because when I learned about it, it was called ADD. That was 1981. And then they came along just to confuse us and stuck the H in there. Yeah. So now there's no such thing as ADD. Yeah. It's ADHD. And you either, and then you have either ADHD without hyperactivity or ADHD yeah. with hyperactivity. But you added a completely new dimension to the thought process because the whole concept of ADD and ADHD was all negative. And you started working hard to make people think about and understand the strengths that were being ignored. Tell us, tell us what, what led you to do well, that? Well, it, it was, it was, to me, it was obvious. I mean, when I learned about this condition in 1981, yeah. meanwhile, up until then, there, there was no whiff of anything. I mean, I'd gone through uh, Harvard College and a Harvard residency and gotten top of my class. I mean, you know, I was thought to be a really smart dude, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then I read about this condition. I'd gone through my residency and yeah. a fellowship in child psychiatry, and I read about heard a lecture about this condition that was then called attention deficit disorder. Mm. And I said, wow, that's me. And I said, and this description of it leaves out all the good part. Yeah. You ah. know, and, and, and so I said, and I know because I've experienced the good part and I've also experienced the frustrating part. And, and so I began, and this was 1981, I began a, a, a voyage, a crusade, uh, a mission, if you will, that continues to this day. And um, by the way, people with ADD, we do much better if we have a mission. So, you know, we, we really ah. do it. If we're, we're very mission-driven. The minute we're a part of a cause, a mission, we ramp up and wow. we get much more involved. So it, uh, is that why people with ADHD seem to be the most interesting people on the earth? I, absolutely, absolutely. But if they don't have a cause, they kind of, you know, they're not that interesting. But, but I also realized from the word go that the term itself, is wrong. It's not only ugly and and insulting and uh, un, unattractive. It's incorrect. Wow. We don't have a deficit of attention at all. I don't have a deficit of attention. I have an abundance of attention. Mm -hmm. My challenge is to control it. Yeah. If I had a deficit, it would be a form of dementia, which I don't have a form of dementia. I may be weird in other ways, but so demented I'm not. And the, and that term, attention deficit yeah. disorder implies that you are demented. Now, you've invented a new term. Yes, yes. Tell us about that. I, I, it, it'll never catch on because I'm not one of the bean counters who makes things catch on, but <laughs> I, I came up with the term uh, vast. Yeah. First of all, this condition is vast. It, it's yeah. so much more than little boys you know, throwing spitballs. It, 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 most entrepreneurs have this. There are Nobel Prize winners who have it. There are yeah, self-made yeah. billionaires who have it. There, wherever you find a, a, a huge amount of creative talent, you'll yeah, find this condition. Exactly. Um, uh, and, and so vast, it's a vast condition. It takes in every part of life. I mean, attention improves everything except sleep. Um, and, and, and so I, I realized that the medical model left out all the yeah. good part. Yeah. And, um, mm -hmm. and I wanted to bring in the good part. Because if you, if you tell someone without giving them a perspective yeah. that they have attention deficit, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, you diminish them yeah. in their own eyes. Yeah. So VAST yeah. in my lexicon stands for variable attention stimulus trait. Love it. Variability, as you know, is, is the hallmark yeah. of ADD. Yeah. People say, well, you can pay attention sometimes. Yes, exactly, that's ADD. Yeah. Sometimes you're hyper-focused, sometimes you're off in the clouds. I mean, so variable attention, another key element yeah. of it. Stimulus, we are constantly seeking high stim. Yeah. We want high stim. We, yeah. we, we, we cannot tolerate, boredom is our kryptonite. Yeah. We cannot tolerate boredom, lack mm. of stimulation. Mm. We can't do it. Mm. And the minute we start losing stimulation, we make something happen. Yeah. You know, we pick a fight or we come up with a new idea or we yeah. go out and play a sport, but we, we can't sit with, with boredom. Yeah. We can't sit without stimulation. So variable attention, stimulus, and then trait, not disorder, trait. Yeah. 
Mm. Because depending upon how you manage it, mm. it can be a horrible disorder or a blessing of a of a, of a, of a blessing, you know. And 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 the, you, you see that. And it's so important how you frame it. People say, "Isn't that just a, a quibble?" Isn't that? No, it's not. Uh, the words you use make a big difference. Mm. If you tell someone they have a disorder, well, you immediately yeah. have, have created a disorder, yeah. namely that they have a disorder. I mean, yeah. how you think of yourself makes a big difference in how mm. you'll do. And, and that's, been, that's been proven. You know, that used to be you know, a kind of old wives tale, but now uh, a ton of work, research led by Carol Dweck uh, has proven that what Henry Ford said decades ago, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right, that that is in fact yeah. scientifically true. Yeah. That if you believe you can do something, you, your chances of doing it go way up. Yeah. And if you believe you can't do something, your chances of, of doing it go way down. Yeah. It's it's so much more than positive thinking. It, it, it's 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 neurological programming. It, it's how you program your brain. Yeah. And, and and by believing you can do something, you give it a boost. And, and intuitively, that makes sense. Yeah, it does. But people have reduced it to just uh, power of positive thinking, all this kind of stuff. They, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you take it seriously, Building your confidence and building your self-esteem and, and building your motivation makes a big difference in, yeah. in how you're going to do. It, I don't want you to give up the idea of getting be, making the term vast the generally accepted term. So even if it takes an uprising, we should be doing that because describing ADHD in the way it's generally described is almost discrimination. Oh, it's it's and it's ignorant and it's stupid and it's wrong. I mean, what other verb can I adjective can I use? I mean, of all things for medical professionals to be using something as backward. I mean, it it, it, it the day will come when ADHD is considered as backward as moron. You know, yeah, moron was yeah. once a, once a diagnostic term in pediatric textbooks. Wow. Moron well, the day will come when ADHD ranks right up there with moron, an idiot, you know, mm. and and, uh, and it's, it pains me because, you know, I have the condition, all three of my uh, kids have the condition. Some of the most interesting people I know, like you, have the condition. Um, I, I, when I die, I want people to wish they had that, yeah. you know, instead of thinking, oh, this is a terrible, condition. no, it's a wannabe. People say, I, I, I don't know if we want to have kids because I have ADD, they might be born mm. with ADD. And I say, oh no, pray that they are born with ADD. Because mm. now, unlike even 50 years ago, we know how to deal with it. We know how to minimize the damage that could be done and maximize the yeah. good that could be done. Yeah. And the, these people, yeah. they do need, they, I like to say it's a gift that's hard to unwrap. Yeah. Ah. It doesn't unwrap itself. You know, I mean, some people intuitively do, and, and uh, that's sort of what I did. Uh, I also have dyslexia, another completely misunderstood condition. Mm. But for most people, if you rely on intuition and it's unwrapping itself, that won't happen. Yeah. In fact, the bad things more likely to happen. And the bad things are real. The prison population is way overrepresented with people with uh, ADD, and the, the addicted population, and the... Uh, uh, the uh, so is the billionaire population. Absolutely, that's what I was going to get to. The billionaire, <laughs> the Nobel Prize winners, the Pulitzer Prize winners, the Academy Award winners, yeah. uh, just the most interesting, dynamic, creative people have it. You know, whether they're diagnosed or not. You know, the people that you in, that are engaging, that you like to talk to, that come up with the new ideas. Yeah. So, uh, what what you've just shared with us, if understood, if implemented, if put through our education system would transform society. Oh, totally, no doubt about it. And, and you're, you know, you're always leery of big statements like that. And you know, if you learn how to control your bowel movements, it'll transform society. You know, <laughs> you know, just, you know just, just sort of nonsense claims. But this claim is very true, that uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if we only could educate the, the population, all these people who are underachieving, if not languishing, if not incarcerated, would be set free as this incredible force of creativity, imagination, innovation, yeah. which we need now more than ever. I mean, yeah. AI can take care of mm. all the grunt work that ever mm. needs to be done, mm. but AI as yet can't innovate the way the way we ADDers can. Exactly. You know, and and uh, so so we we really need us. The world really needs us. And um, uh, the the obstacle is, as it always has been, ignorance and stigma. 
Yeah. You know, ignorance begets stigma. Mm -hmm. we, we tend, it's such a horrible part of human nature. We tend to fear, deplore, and despise anything different. Yeah. There yeah. was a time when left-handed people, I'm left-handed, we, yeah. we were deplored and despised. Uh, you know, so it's wo woven into human nature, the, the fear which leads to attack of anything different. That's what the heart of racism is all about. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hatred and fear of anything different. And then the desire to sequester, mm -hmm. if, if not, if not uh, uh, put to death, uh, the, the people who are different. What's it gonna take to turn this perception around. You're saying it's gonna be hard to get people to accept the new term of asked. You, you well, wouldn't... what it'll take, first of all, if God would pay attention, it could be done in a minute, but it's hard to get God's attention. <laughs> and so I happen to believe in God, but uh, you know, and, and but I, I know that I can't dial up God, you know, so uh, God, would you please fix this? So we have to do God's work, okay? And, and doing God's work is educating people. Yeah. Uh, and getting past their 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 prejudice. Yeah. I mean, they they, yeah. they believe. When I started off, they laughed at me. I mean, they, they yeah. said you're making excuses for people who want to get mm. out of doing their homework. You want to make excuses for stupid kids. I mean, when I was a kid, I'm 73 years old. When I was a kid, there were two diagnoses in this area: smart and stupid. And the, and there was one treatment: try harder. Mm. And if that didn't work, they'd beat you. Mm. And if that didn't work, just very stupid and you were cast off. Do you know how many people who, whose lives were ruined by that? Mm. Who People who could have been major mm. contributors, mm. lives were ruined by that. I mean, you look at our founding fathers and their, their wives as well, I'm sure. They're a hotbed of this condition. Yeah. They were all busy fighting with each other mm. and bubbling with these new ideas and, and yeah. they invent the greatest democracy in the history of the world. Yeah, And, and out of out of thin air, really. I mean, they, they, you can name the philosophers they borrowed from, but they got together. They were a cantankerous, querulous group of men, and they fought it out. Yeah. And what comes out of that? Our Constitution, the greatest document mm. ever written. To mm. to uh, and and we've we've lasted longer than any mm. democracy has, and and mm. and we're modeled on your Parliament. I mean, mm. the the two great gifts English civilization has given to the world, in my opinion, are number one, Parliament. And number two, mm -hmm. our literature, English literature. Mm -hmm. I mean, Shakespeare, unmatched. Mm -hmm. So those two things. And then we, we built upon your parliamentary system and made it, tweaked it in some ways that made it better, in my opinion. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, of course, our literature can't possibly match what you've got. But um, uh, it, it, it all depends upon setting free the mind. Yeah. That's what it depends upon. And, and, uh, um, it, for various reasons throughout history, there, there's been a concerted effort to squash down innovation, yeah. promote conformity, yeah. and and promote lockstep behavior, yeah. extinguish new ideas because they're disruptive. I mean, I, I, Plato, you know, said, "Get the poets out of the Republic. We don't want people like that." You know, mm. they they mm. they cause trouble, mm. and and it's true. We do. Yeah. We cause trouble. Uh, I remember in the in the fifth grade, a, a teacher said to me, "Ned, you know you're subversive." <laughs> well, I didn't know what subversive meant, so I said, "Is that good or bad?" He said, "It's not good." So I went and looked up subversive, and, and yeah, I was constantly undermining what I thought were stupid rules and and you know people in authority. But I managed to get through. I, I had two things going for me. The reason that I survived, you know, it, number one, when I was a little boy, I was very cute. And number two, I had high IQ. And mm -hmm. Those two things saved me because by statistics, have you ever heard of the ACEs score? Yes. Okay. Well, the ACEs score of zero to ten. Yeah. Anything four or above. Just mean, to explain what that is. Well, the ACEs is the it's the largest, most reliable study of adverse childhood yeah. experiences. That's what ACEs to ACEs, -E yeah. adverse childhood experiences. And it's the it's the only one that's systematic and huge in scope. Yeah, and and the the study has, has yielded up t ten objective markers of yeah. trauma of, of, and incarceration, abuse, yeah. uh, neglect. Ten of them, <clears throat> objective, and the data says that if you have four or more, the chances of your yeah. living past the age of fifty are slim. Your chances of becoming a drug addict very high. Multiple divorces. 
uh, incarceration, uh, violence, marginalization, lousy life waits you if you have four or more of these. Yeah. I have eight. Wow. A score of eight. So statistically, I should be dead or at best on the margins. So, so why aren't you? What well, you do differently? Well, uh, 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 you're, you're kind to say I'm not. Uh, um, the, reason, <laughs> the, the reason that I beat the odds, in my opinion, uh, is the power of one word, which is love. Yeah. And I found it. I yeah. found it. And I lucked out. I found people mm. who were willing to give it. Mm. Now, they may, have, may not have called it love because love makes people nervous. Love is too touchy-feely. But a word that people can be comfortable with is connection. Yeah. And I was able to connect with just about anybody. Yeah. And, I, and I had the two things working for me. I was cute and smart. And, and so I beat tremendous odds. Wow. And, and, uh, uh, and you add two. And you see, that's why I love the people with ADD, because they're right there at the fork in the road. They could go one way or the other. Yeah. They could be the prison population or the Nobel Prize winners. And, and, and it's up to us, society, to stop torturing them and sequestering them and start promoting them. And, and because they are one of, if not our absolute greatest resource, untapped resource. Uh, Particularly yeah. now, the world needs what we can do more than ever. Yeah. And, then, and another thing that it's too bad, everyone wants a manual, a procedure, a recipe. You know, it's, everybody wants that. I mean, they want it, rep, yeah. you know, re re repeatable, teachable. About, you can't replicate and, and, and put into a, 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 a manual what we do. Yeah. You, know, you ask someone with ADD, how in the world did you do that? The honest answer is, I don't know. And you ask someone, why did you do that? I don't know. Mm. You know why did you marry her? I don't know. Mm. Uh, <laughs> how did you come up with the uh, idea of the polymerase chain reaction? I don't know. By the way, that, that was Kerry Mullis, and it's of all the advances in biology, in the past 50 years, it ranks right up there with the double helix in terms of changing the world. Yeah. And he had flaming <laughs> ADD, what mm -hmm. I still call ADD. And uh, 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 he was just a pain in the butt to so many people. Mm -hmm. But he was a bloody genius. I mean, and and uh, I'll tell you the story. Do we have time for me to tell you the story? We do. Okay. The story of his uh, discovering, inventing, creating the polymerase chain reaction is a wonderful story. So he lived in California, and um, uh, he, he, he enjoyed the company of, of women. And so one day, he was driving down the coast of California with his latest girlfriend, and um, they came upon a break, one of those sort of off-the-road little areas, and there was a beautiful sunset. So they pulled off the road to watch the sunset, and um, they were enchanted by it. Well, his girlfriend was so transfixed, she fell asleep. And he was a nice guy. He didn't wake her up. He let her sleep. Well, while she was sleeping, into his mind swam this polymerase chain reaction. Wow. And he took an envelope from the glove compartment, started writing down notes about it. And in 15 minutes, he'd come up with the idea that changed wow. the world. And... Um, so he had to rush back to the lab, so he had to wake up his girlfriend. And, and he said to her when he woke her up, honey, I've just won the Nobel Prize. She said, what do you mean? He said, I know this is a Nobel Prize that I just thought up. And sure enough, it was. And it, it, but that is so representative, mm -hmm. unanticipated, mm -hmm. spontaneous. By the way, that, that's the upside of impulsivity. Impulsivity is yeah. one of the things that's supposedly so bad about ADD. If you eliminate impulsivity, you eliminate creativity. Yeah. Your creativity depends upon something Outside out of nowhere box. hitting you. Mm -hmm. And it depends upon your being receptive to it. So yeah. Kerry Mullis, instead of watching that idea, saying that that's not proven, he, he, he took it and ran with it, and the world is the beneficiary of it. Wow. You've described that, that fork in the road. We've got an education system that influences virtually every child. Yes. What's your view on how, or if and how, the education system could be changed so that it makes the best of all of these traits? Well, in, in my opinion, the, the, the one formal system that comes closest to ideal is, is the Montessori, uh, because mm. it's curiosity-driven. Mm. And that's, that's what learning should be about. It should be 
following your curiosity, following your interest. And we need teachers to uh, fan those flames, but also to provide information when you, where you need information yeah. to continue to build what you're building. Yeah. And that's what life should be. Yeah. Uh, school should not, homework is stupid. It's, it's mm. counterproductive. It quashes down enthusiasm. Mm. How many kids look forward to going to school? Not that many. And, and the ones who do look forward to it have found a system or a teacher that, that in, encourages curiosity. So it, education should be project-based, not memorization-based. Yeah. Yeah. It should be build a boat yeah. or interview yeah. a, a, an old person or mm. uh, figure out a way to sail a boat without a sail or wh whatever. You know, something yeah. that challenges your curiosity and imagination. That's what we need to be using is imagination, it, 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 mm. which I call play. My definition of play is not what you do at recess. My mm -hmm. definition of play is any activity in which your imagination gets wow. involved. Yeah. Any activity w where your imagination gets involved, that's play. That's what you should be doing all day. Yeah. Uh, the opposite of play is doing exactly what you're told. Robotic behavior. And that passes for education in a lot of schools in the US and I imagine over here too, and it gets rewarded and yeah. you get the prizes and blah, blah, blah. blah. And, and does, that, does that benefit the world? No, mm. the world needs people with imagination and drive. And it, I spent um, uh, a number of years, two or three years consulting to the Harvard chemistry department. The Harvard chemistry department is one of the greatest departments in the world. And they have now, as of now, they have six Nobel Prize winners on the chemistry faculty. Wow. And um, uh, they called me in because this is around 1999. Their most gifted graduate student committed suicide mm. and left a note explicitly <laughs> blaming Harvard. And this kid was not some troubled genius. He was mm. a Joe Normal from the Midwest. Mm. And he had to be Joe Normal genius. And uh, he left a note saying, I was driven to this by Harvard's sick system of, mm -hmm. uh, of being. And, and um, uh, he just felt so isolated mm -hmm. and so cut off and had, didn't have anywhere to turn. Well, I learned from them uh, a lot of things. One, the, the absolute necessity for connection, that it's lethal, yeah. disconnection is lethal, but connection is formative. I mean, mm -hmm. it just, it's the magic ingredient. Um, mm -hmm. But I also learned it, 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 the Harvard uh, chemistry department gets the most outstanding applicants mm -hmm. on paper from around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, every year a new, a new crop of a thousand graduate students and postdocs mm -hmm. show up in Cambridge. And the mandate is go into the lab and discover new knowledge. Mm -hmm. One group runs into the lab, you know, they're cavorting <laughs> and exciting and blowing up the building, you know, they got this, that, the other, you know, and they're just, it's like a think tank going wild because mm -hmm. there's so many of them. The other group freezes up and says, you got to tell me what to do. I'll do whatever mm -hmm. you want. I'll wash mm -hmm. your test tubes. I'll grade your papers. I'll monitor your exams. Mm -hmm. I'll do anything, but you got to tell me what to do. Ask me to come up with an idea of my own to test and what, I can't do that. What happened was back around fifth grade, they got the message that what they were supposed to do was memorize and, mm -hmm. and obey. And that's fine to get you mm -hmm. A's in school, but to get you A's in life, mm -hmm. to make you a game changer, you've got to be able to come up with something on your own, not just do what you're told. Mm -hmm. And these poor kids, they, they work so hard, slave so hard, they get to the, the the top of the mountain and they discover they're deep in the valley. So what did you tell them to do differently? Oh, oh, they knew. And I just, I said, we need to create a space that makes it that safe and possible. Yeah. The chair of the department is 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 a saint. He's We're still good friends. His name is Jim Anderson. He's one of the uh, world authorities on global warming. And he, he, he put his entire research career on hold. This is around wow. 2000. And it, it's very dangerous to put your research co mm. career on hold if you're a scientist. But he did. He said, I can't sanction this. It could, turned out that suicide was like the eighth suicide in that department in the wow. past 10 years. That's a, in suicidology, that's an epidemic. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and, and it, instead of looking into it, they just swept him under the rug. And, and as a Harvard grad, I can tell you, it's a part of the institution I, I am ashamed of. They, they very much think sink or swim. Yeah. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. And we've yeah. got 100 people who will replace you in a heartbeat. So yeah. suck it up and get it together or go elsewhere. Well, that's not the way you should 
run a mm. educational institution or to run anything. Mm. And Jim Anderson said, no, we're gonna do it differently. Wow. And we, we went around, you know, it was, it, the, the place was an it was a exercise in disconnection. Mm. So how do you bring together these, yeah. these middle European geniuses who don't know how to socialize mm. at all? How do you bring them together and create connection? Well, you can't do it by having a mixer because they'd all stay home. Mm. What's the magic? What is the most connecting ingredient we've got? Food. So we put out these wonderful, <laughs> lavish buffets from Cambridge's best restaurants in the department library that used to have signs saying no food or drink allowed. Yeah. And every other week we'd have these banquets and these impoverished genius graduate students would come out for the food. Mm. You know, they'd stuff it in their pockets, and, mm. but they'd start talking to other, one another oh. in spite of themselves. Yeah. And the next thing you know, a, a symphony club was formed, a softball club was formed. Mm. Uh, uh, we put uh, whiteboards next to the elevators so they, they wouldn't stand oh. there self-consciously, you know, look at, they could write equations mm. and talk with each other in, mm. in that language. Um, uh, we knocked down the, the, the oaken walls that made the place look like a, like a prison. Yeah. and replace it with, with glass walls, so you had sight lines. And oh. we took one uh, room that it was just filled with uh, canisters of liquid nitrogen and cleaned those out and turned it into an espresso bar with a grand piano. Well, it turned out a lot of these grad students were pianists. Yeah. And so you'd yeah. w walk through the place and you'd hear jazz and classical music wafting through the corridors. It was a total turnaround, and, and, and this is a very statistically significant fact, since the year 2000, there have been zero suicides. Wow. And, and Ned, uh, Ned, we've come to the end of part one oh, of oh. this exciting. Yeah. This, is, this is just a masterclass. <laughs> and I'm sure you've raised an awful lot more questions than you've actually answered so far. But you have touched on, you have touched on some really important topics, and that is the, the, the link, the overlap between, between traits of ADHD and anxiety and trauma. In part two, we're going to delve into that. I want to probe Dr. Hallowell's experience and what can we do about it? What's the best way to look after my child so that I bring out the best in him or her? What's the best way to look after my class if I'm a teacher to make the most of all of these traits? Can we do something to change the name from ADHD to VAST? So come back to part two and we're going to probe Dr. Hallowell some more Thank you for part one. Thank you so much.